Thank you everyone for bearing with us. Um, I understand that um, BJ, who was hoping to open the session for us, has been held up. So I'm going to hand over to our Chief of Scientific Advisor, Stephen Belcher, um, just to open the session for us. And then we'll hand over to um, Marcelo Morales, who's Secretary for Research and Science um, Education from Brazil's Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation Department, to say a few words by way of introduction. Then we'll hand across to um, some of the scientists that have been working on this fantastic piece of work. Um, and then we'll, we'll open the floor to you guys to ask us a few questions. Alongside this, we are also running online um, because we've got a lot of people watching in Brazil, um, apparently, which is very exciting. At the bottom of the slide here and throughout all of the presentations, there's a link open, www.slido.com with a, a number, 021388, which you can see at the bottom. Please feel free to pop your questions in there if you're online or even if you're in the room. And if you'd like to have a specific question answered or you see something that you think is quite interesting, you can vote for that question to come to the top of the pile. So that's how the technology will work. But I shall hand you over now to Stephen Belcher just to open, and then Marcella Moraes will come up. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. This is an unexpected pleasure. I think I say that with some sense of reality, uh, unlike normally when you say that. Um, the Met Office, uh, the UK community indeed, has been working very productively with the Brazilian community um, on climate change matters, and particularly the Amazon, for really 25 years now. So it's actually a huge pleasure and an honor to be able to just open this session up and, and we were discussing, Dr. Morales and I, some of the highlights of, of that collaboration. And I think this Amazon face could really add a huge amount to that. And as we're going to hear, this is a really inspirational project that could give us real insight into the future of the Amazon forest and its role in the global carbon cycle. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about it. And with that, I will hand over to Dr. Morales. So good evening, and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to, to talk with you. And uh, first, I would like to thank the, the scientists. And thank you very much for your dedication and important collaboration. Uh, not only the Brazilians, but uh, we have a, a special uh, collaboration with the UK. It's a special and very long collaboration with the UK. And thank you very much for this opportunity again uh, to collaborate uh, with you. So thank you for the opportunity and the invitation by the United Kingdom. And on behalf of Minister uh, Marcus Pontes, uh, we are honored to, uh, to be part of such uh, an important event uh, addressing such a significant issue in the global context uh, here at COPI. Uh, 26. The Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation from Brazil uh, has a mission to produce knowledge, wealth and quality of life of, uh, of, for Brazilians. Therefore, it works uh, truly on the climate change and sustainable development agenda in order to foster the country's growth. I would also uh, like to say that the Ministry sees Amazon face as extremely important and the specific uh, the scientific collaboration between Brazil and UK would be crucial to develop uh, some actions to provide basic support to the infrastructure based in the Amazon forest. Uh, we have so many uh, projects in, for Amazon. Uh, we have the INPI, uh, the, the Institute Gildi, the Museum Gildi, uh, and also the Institute Mamirawa from the Ministry of Science and Technology. Uh, and we are building 50 satellite laboratories, floating satellite laboratory in, in the Amazon. And they are going to be managed by those institutions. So the Amazon phase is a uni unique opportunity to join effort uh, to other ongoing initiatives such as the Amazon uh, Tall Tower Observatory, uh, uh, ATO, another scientific collaboration between Brazil and Germany uh, that aims to uh, at reducing uncertainties on the planet's weather and climate, uh, climate uh, forest models. 
So the Amazon face also intersects with the SALAS, the satellite Amazon uh, laboratory system uh, that we call SALAS, Sistema Amazonico de Laboratório Satellites, that, que eu acabei de, uh, that I, I just talked uh, talk about, 50 that we're going to build in Amazon. Uh, the Vitoria Regia is the first one, is already uh, uh, placed. And uh, the SALAS, uh, we are building this infrastructure to support scientific research in Amazon territory. So one of the SALA that we are going to call FACE, SALA's FACE, we are going to build together with this infrastructure to give a support of the data and scientists in the Amazon. And I have the, the pleasure to announce for, uh, that recently under the National Development Scientific and Technological Fund, the FNDCT, uh, for uh, the ministry have approved a uh, source to establish one laboratory under SALAS project in the Amazon face area. So we are very enthusiastic about this collaboration and we, uh, for sure we are going to, to work in this project as priority. Thank you very much. And I understand that Vijay may have just joined us. Would you like to say your few opening remarks? I know you're a few minutes late, but um, Dr. Morales just managed to uh, start us off. <laughs> I had to, I've already introduced you, but. <laughs> First of all, I'm really sorry to be, uh, to be late. I'm afraid COP is as mad as everyone says it is and trying to run anything. Um, I just want to say a couple of really brief things. First is I've just come back from three and a half years of being ambassador in Brazil, seeing the amazing beauty and importance of the, the rainforest in all the biomes of Brazil. Uh, second, I'm back now in uh, FCDO running our health and climate work and hence involved in parts of this. And one of the curious uh, lacuna, one of the real gaps in our understanding was the effect of carbon dioxide concentrations on tropical rainforests. So it is incredibly fantastic that we're able to fund uh, Amazon Face. I think this is a totally exciting project. Um, I think it's a great example of the other thing which struck me when I went to Brazil and continues to amaze me all the time, which is the, the UK-Brazil science relationship, which Ambassador Fred Jehuda at the back will also be able to speak eloquently to the number of scientific links, the warmth and the depth and the breadth of our scientific collaboration is fantastic. And I think this places, and Amazon Face places this firmly in the context of our joint work on forests, on climate change, which is one of the great um, challenges of our time. And I don't have to say that to you because we're all here at, at, at COP26. So I'm really pleased by this. It's got a strong personal uh, meaning for me, but I think in the future, it will also be one of those really important pieces of science collaboration between our countries with the Met Office, who have been a wonderful collaborators around all of this, um, with all of our Brazilian collaborators as well, uh, and I hope a great example uh, of how we're going to tackle climate change in the future. Thank you, and apologies for being late again. Thank you so much. If you'd like to take us, uh, both Dr. Morales and um, Vijay, if you wanted to take a seat on the stage, you're very welcome to, because um, there will be some questions coming shortly. We're, we're soliciting questions online. Um, so following those wonderful opening remarks, um, I think it's sort of set a bit of an excitement around, but what is Amazon Face? How, how is it going to work? So we've got three presenters with us now who are going to walk us through the work that they're doing, the fantastic research. So I'd just like to introduce, we have Beto Quesada, um, who is um, the co-lead for Amazon Face from Brazil's National Institute for Amazonian Research. We have David Lapola, um, co-lead for the Amazon Face from Brazil, Brazil's University of Campinas. And we have Richard Betts from the Met Office. He's a Met Office Fellow and Head of Climate Impacts at the Met Office and a Research Chair in Climate Impacts at the University of Exeter. So I'm going to hand over to the presenters to introduce the project for you. Please don't forget the Slido link is open for those of you that would like to ask us some questions. There are already some on there. Um, and feel free to, to start your presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot for 
not sure it's on. It's on? Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And believe me, it's, it has a lot of meaning for me as well, this experiment, and for a lot of people back in Brazil and in the Amazon. But our time is short, so uh, we would like to make a few points to explain you the experiment here. The first one uh, is that uh, the Amazon is providing a key uh, ecosystem service to humanity by absorbing a considerable part of the atmospheric CO2 from the atmosphere to, 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 to its biomass, okay? But we don't know how long this will last, okay? If you see the yellow line there uh, in the years more closer to the left-hand side there, these are observations we have in the Amazon showing that the Amazon is acting as a carbon sink uh, in the last decades. But the projections based on these observations indicate that this carbon sink will reduce in the near future, and probably the forest will become carbon neutral and even worse, become a source of carbon to the atmosphere sometime in the next decade. Uh, this is really uh, uh, something we don't want to happen because then the forest would stop helping us take up uh, or take this CO2 out from the atmosphere. The black line shows what the current models employed by IPCC and many other studies, the average, how they show the carbon sink in the Amazon forest will behave in the future. And you see the difference there. It's showing, in fact, that the, the, the carbon sink, this absorption of carbon, will increase. What is this difference there? Uh, the main reason, uh, the best explanation for, for this is what we call the CO2 fertilization effect, which basically is when you add more CO2, remember CO2 is a basic input to photosynthesis. When you add more CO2 uh, to plants in general, they hypothetically increase their photosynthesis and theoretically can increase their biomass, but this is only hypothetical and, and theoretical in the Amazon. We don't know if this effect really exists there uh, and if this is involved in the weakening of the carbon sink uh, in the Amazon. Uh, and how it will behave in the future. Remember one detail here, that when plants absorb more CO2, again, theoretically, they transpire less. So the, the flux of moisture from plants, from the leaves to the atmosphere is theoretically reduced. This is gonna have uh, a huge implication, large scale implication there. Uh, we are talking about here what was 20 years ago or so called the Amazon forest dieback. More recently, it's called uh, the Amazon tipping point. So explaining quickly, uh, strong climate change in the region, uh, increasing temperature, uh, strong reduction of rainfall would cause uh, the loss of the climatic conditions to hold a tropical forest, uh, such as the one we have. Some models say there will be a savanization, other models say there will be a replacement by a dry forest or so. But the fact is the same models show that the forest stays, stays more or less the same if we have indeed such a CO2 fertilization effect in place and if it's a strong one. But this is only with the poor knowledge we have from temperate forests from other experiments not located in tropical zones. Okay, we don't know if this effect exists, how long it lasts, and, and how, how strong it is. And just a, a, a side note here, please. Uh, when we say we see that flux of water as well, when you change the CO2, it reminds us that this is not a problem about carbon only. It's a problem of water 
as well. It's a problem of biodiversity because this is going to be the first phase experiment in a, in a forest with high biodiversity, with a lot of plant species. The previous ones had a couple, one or a couple of uh, different plant species. And it's, of course, also, if you look the scenario uh, on the left there, it's obviously a socioeconomic problem as well. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Right. Um, hello? Hello? Right. Uh, so the idea is to deal with the questions that Davi was imposing and all this that we need to know about the Amazon forest, uh, how it will behave in climate change. The idea is the idea for the experiment, what we do, you know, uh, we will build a open air laboratory to mimic what the future atmospheric conditions will be and study what the trees will do in those conditions. So the idea there, the engineering of it, is to create what is in this image in the right here. We will create six of those uh, rings, uh, each one of 16 towers that will be blowing CO2 on the trees. Assisted by a tower in the middle, some canopy crane, so we can access each one of the trees, uh, fully instrumented with scientific, the most recent scientific instruments we can think about, to, um, and then this would create an atmosphere around the trees that is 50% richer in CO2 than uh, what we have outside. So the idea is a fully replicated uh, experiment that will work as an open air lab. And then um, it's more or less what is represented in the, in the, in the other picture uh, with these six rings across the, the landscape there. Um, this is, the experiment is there actually in the field since 2015, and we have been already monitoring those areas, already monitoring those trees, um, with the view to understand every process that may change with high CO2. Uh, so to, to work as a baseline, uh, then we, Actually, doing so, we are probably the most well-studied forest in the whole tropics because we have a team of scientists dedicated to, to work in this forest um, from below ground, above ground, all together at the same time, um, methodologically consistent in a way that we can look at it in an integrated way. And we got a lot from this already, from knowing the ecological processes and functioning of those forests before we throw the CO2 on it. Um, also, one interesting thing is uh, uh, beyond of the baseline, we have already started some CO2 work on those open top chambers. And we have some already very interesting res responses, but for the small trees, like the forest of tomorrow. Uh, but we can talk about that later. Um, so the idea with those studies and going to that level of detail is because some of the process, we are talking about climate change, we are talking about the future of the Amazon, but some of the processes that actually occur in a very small scale in a leaf or in a root in the yellow picture there, uh, can actually be transported to a much broader scale and which can actually affect regional uh, Amazon, South America, or even the globe. You know, so it, it's important to think about something like Davi said, you have this tomata exchanging water and getting CO2. Uh, if we release less water, for instance, you reduce the evaporation, you know, the transpiration of water from the trees, which is responsible for most of, for, for a significant part of the rainfall in the area and in South America, as shown in this picture, um, we are actually changing 
the whole of South America. So we, we can, we have to think that we are looking at interesting ecological phenomena in very small scale, but this actually has uh, global implications, right? And for instance, the, the, the changing water cycle would be something really dramatic. Which, which you obviously can think in this specific example of the water cycle, if you reduce the flux of moisture from the forest to the atmosphere because of the increase in, in atmospheric CO2, how this affects the forest, so this linkage between the climate, the forest, and society. Uh, it's not hard for us to think how this can impact the rainfall totals in the region, river navigability, water provision to people, water for agriculture, uh, uh, generation of energy, hydropower. So uh, the experiment is far from being only basic science. It has intrinsic relations with socioeconomic issues and implications. But the, the, the idea is that the results we get from the experiment help us understand how this future might be and help people prepare for this future. I mean, if we're gonna have a different forest with a different functioning affecting local peoples in the future, uh, it's really important that we know this in advance to help people get prepared for this. And with that, we we'll finish this very quick talk. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the, the introduction and overview of the uh, Amazon Face experiment. I'm, I'm really excited to be at, this, at the start of working on this with you. Uh, you've been working on it for, for 10 years. <laughs> so we're really, really pleased to, uh, to be coming in to, to, to partner on this. So it's, it's a very exciting time. Um, I'm going to... Sorry, you're getting a preview of the talk here. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about um, some other work that we've been doing uh, in partnership uh, with Brazil uh, and the UK uh, for some years. As Stephen Bell just said at the start, we've been working in, in, in partnership in, in some form or another for about 25 years now, uh, starting on the climate modelling uh, side and particularly focusing on the Amazon, but also now in more recent years broadening out to other areas of, uh, of Brazil as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about this uh, program called the CSSP, Brazil CSSP's Climate Science for Service Partnership, um, which Berto has been involved in for some years uh, already, and that, that involves three institutions in Brazil, INPA, who are of course involved in Amazon Face, INP, and also SEMADEN. Uh, and uh, we, have a, we have three, three aspects uh, to, that, uh, to that program, and I will explain how the Amazon Face work ties in with this, this work as a, as a separate but related program, and I'll also, also talk about how this links in with climate policy at the global scale, uh, linking in with the CSP Brazil, which is a, a very kind of a policy and action focused program, hence the service uh, word within the, within the program. So there's three aspects to the CSSP Brazil. Uh, there's developing climate modeling, uh, in partnership between the UK and Brazil, but Brazil has been developing its own climate models in, in, in recent years, and we've been really pleased to uh, to work together with, with Brazilian colleagues uh, on that. Um, we've got a strong element on climate impacts and disaster risk reduction. That's particularly where Semaden come in because they've got this responsibility for understanding uh, and ultimately predicting the risks of uh, of natural disasters uh, in Brazil. And then the third area is uh, a, a strong component uh, on ecosystems within Brazil and the carbon cycle and the role of those within the global carbon cycle. And that's where Amazon Face ties in, of course. So just one example of, uh, of one of the papers that we've, uh, scientific papers we've produced this year on the disaster risk reduction uh, work in partnership with Samaden. This is uh, projections of landslide risks uh, across Brazil uh, using Met Office climate models. 
uh, and, and a, a statistical relationship between uh, the uh, heavy rain uh, and landslide risk. So it's a, with this, an, in, an index for landslide risk, essentially. And the darker the red, uh, the greater the risk of landslides and, under heavy rain. And it's maps of that increase in risk at three levels of global warming, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, and 4 degrees global warming. Uh, and you can see that, as you might expect, the increase of landslide risk uh, it is greater at uh, the highest level of global warming that we go to. So that underlines yet another reason why we know we, we need to reduce global warming and limit it to well below uh, 2 degrees, and ideally 1.5 degrees global warming, to limit this risk amongst many others. Another risk we've been looking at, uh, again in, in partnership with uh, Brazilian collaborators, both in INPA and INP in this one. Uh, so this is I uh, impacts of climate change on wildfires and burnt area. So again, this is using climate model projections. It's uh, only one model, uh, only the Met Office model. O other models would, could give diff different results, and that would be for future work. But it's translating the, the change in climate into the change in uh, wildfire activity and the area burnt, uh, making certain simplistic assumptions about uh, direct human impact through land use and ignition and so on. Um, and again, as you would expect, uh, the impact is more severe at higher levels of global warming. Again, we're looking at 1.5, 2, 3 and 4 degrees global warming. Uh, and at 4 degrees global warming, which is still possible within the current trajectory uh, of global emissions, that there would be very large areas um, projected to be burned as a result of uh, climate change. So this emphasises again why we need to keep warming below uh, 2 degrees to help uh, reduce wildfire risk, not only in the Amazon, but across Brazil and wide, the wider South American region. And finally, uh, as a third example from the CSSP Brazil project, uh, this is actually looking at the interactions between climate change and, and forests in the other direction, is the impact of deforestation on climate. So uh, we know about the role of forests in the carbon cycle, so deforestation would... Uh, releases carbon to the atmosphere, accelerates the CO2 rise and accelerates global warming. But it has other effects as well. Uh, uh, we heard in the earlier talks about the role of uh, evaporation through the forests. Um, as well as being affected by CO2, evaporation is affected by the actual nature and extent of the forest. Uh, and simplistically speaking, if you fragment or reduce forest cover, uh, you reduce evaporation. That reduces the... Uh, the, co the cooling effect of that evaporation, it reduces the uh, cloud cover over the forest and it causes more warming. Um, so these, the graph uh, on the right here shows three scenarios of deforestation uh, across the Amazon and the impacts on, on temperature averaged across the Amazon. With the, the green bar on the, on the left is a, is a slight deforestation scenario, so it's not intact anymore, but it's, it's not severely deforested. Um, and it's quite complex. The, the, the uh, the green bar which goes extend, extends above and below the zero line, so that the, the possibilities are either a warming or a cooling with smaller levels of deforestation there. The black lines show this a wider range of possibilities, much lower likelihoods. If you go to a moderate scenario of deforestation, it could be slightly more warming, the higher end on the, the orange bar, uh, but also still some cooling. But then if you go to the severe deforestation, the dark, dark red uh, uh, bar on the far right uh, is completely in the uh, the warming uh, side of the equation. So up to well, over half a degree local warming uh, by severe deforestation in the Amazon. So, Amazon. so again, that underlines the importance of preserving the Amazon for the local and the global climate as well. So back to Amazon Face, uh, which links in with the CSSP Brazil work on, on ecosystems. I just wanted to uh, add to what's already been said uh, about why this uh, is important for, uh, in the global climate policy context. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, figure which was produced in the, uh, the IPCC 6 Assessment Working Group 1 report, which was published uh, a few months ago. Uh, and this is a, a figure of the... Along the bottom, it's the cumulative CO2 emissions since 1850. So it's every year's emissions of carbon dioxide added to the previous years. So it builds up and builds up over, uh, as we go further to the right. Um, and up the side, this is the global average surface temperature. So we've got the Paris Agreement targets of 
one, uh, 1 1.5 degrees, which is the, the target we're ideally aiming for, or two degrees, or aiming to just keep warming below. Um, so what we're seeing in the black line, that's the historical cumulative emissions uh, and historical global warming plotted together. So as emissions have increased, we've increased warming uh, to over one degree global warming uh, at the present time, almost 1.2 degrees, in fact. And then the bars going on to the future, they're showing the range of possibilities uh, of global temperature uh, in response to uh, further sets of uh, CO2 emissions, cumulative again over time, going out to uh, the, uh, the year 2050, so the middle of this, this century. Uh, so what we're seeing is the, uh, the warming that would result under different uh, ongoing emissions scenarios uh, by the middle of this century. So the, uh, the lines in the middle show the central estimate of that. Uh, so for uh, 3,000 gigatons of CO2 or billion tons of CO2 emitted since 1850, the central estimate would be that that would lead to uh, exceeding or just, just meeting the, the 1.5 degree global warming threshold. So anything beyond that would, would break the, the, this Paris uh, Agreement ambition. But a key point here is there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in that. The width of these bars shows the range of temperatures that could uh, result from this 3,000 uh, billion tonnes of CO2 uh, emissions. So it could be much more than 1.5 degrees warming, or it could be less. We don't know. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, for that uh, is uh, uncertainties in... Uh, cloud cover and water vapour in the atmosphere and how the physical climate system, the atmosphere, responds to the build-up of CO2 in the atmosphere. But another uh, important uncertainty is actually how these emissions translate into the build-up of CO2 into the atmosphere, because that is not well, uh, well known for, uh, in future models at all. Uh, but it's perhaps, perhaps less widely recognised as, as an uncertainty in, in future projections. Uh, some of you may have seen this figure, which was published uh, last week. Um, it's from the, from the Global Carbon Budget, which is produced every year by, by the, an organisation called the Global Carbon Project, and many people in the room are in, uh, in, involved in this. Um, and this shows the flows of carbon through the whole uh, climate system uh, each year. So each year we're emitting 35 billion tonnes of CO2 to the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning. Um, 4 billion tonnes uh, released uh, from land use change. The land biosphere uh, takes up 11 billion tonnes uh, of CO2 each year, and the oceans take up 10 billion tonnes uh, uh, each year. There's uncertainties on these in the, in the numbers in the brackets. But the result of the input to the atmosphere and the removal by sinks is that the atmospheric CO2 increases by about 19 uh, uh, billion tonnes uh, of CO2 each year, so between two and three parts per million of atmospheric CO2. And that's what it's doing at the moment, but the key thing is, will these sinks continue into the future? Will the land biosphere continue to take up CO2 from the atmosphere as it is doing at the moment? Uh, and one reason this sink exists is because of uh, the effect of CO2 in the atmosphere fertilising plant growth, as David said earlier, the CO2 fertilisation effect is a really crucial component to that sink. But we don't know how strongly that sink will continue into the future. And this is where face experiments like Amazon face uh, are really important because we're, we're trying to model the future with computer models of climate, um, but we can, we can only get that right if we know what the real ecosystems do. We have face experiments in some ecosystems in different parts of the world already. Uh, there's one here in the UK in Staffordshire, and we're visiting this next week, aren't we, which will be very exciting. Uh, but there's never been one in a tropical rainforest, uh, and the tropical forests are a key part of the global climate system, so it's really important that we get this real-world experiment up and running in the Amazon to inform these models and show us how whether this, this sink will continue, because that affects the... Uh, the amount of CO2 that we left in the atmosphere in response to these uh, emissions. If the land sink is weakened, more CO2 will remain in the atmosphere and build up and cause more warming. So Amazon Face uh, will help us to estimate these future carbon sinks uh, and help us to improve our predictions uh, of, of the response of uh, uh, the global climate system to, to future emissions. And therefore, it will help us narrow this uncertainty range into how much carbon we could emit 
if we want to stay below these targets of certain levels of global warming, like 1.5 and 2 degrees and so on. Of course, it will take some years for this to play out and work its way through into models and so on, so we're not going to get any quick answers, but it will be really, really crucial uh, to informing the global climate policy and setting these global carbon budgets uh, and, and letting us know exactly how much we need to limit warming, li limit emissions by in order to meet the Paris Agreement targets. Thank you. So um, thank you very much to the researchers for sharing with us the work that they're undertaking. Um, we've had a couple of questions online and um, gone slightly over with the presentations, but that's fine. This seems to be uh, running a little bit late this evening. Um, we've got one question online, um, which I think is quite an easy one for the researchers to be able to answer. And then I wonder if I could just have a show of hands for anyone who has any questions for our panel here, just so that we can gauge interest. Wonderful. We've got two questions, three questions, four questions in the room, quite a few questions in the room. So the, the first one, which I think will be a fairly easy one for the researchers to, to answer is um, actually from Rob McKenzie. So to the point that Rich just made. So this is one of the other face experiments. Great news about Amazon face, as well as being so important in its own right, is there a science on which Brazil, UK and Australia face activities can combine? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, we can connect different biomes, isn't it? Responses of different biomes. Uh, so far, the Amazon has been the only one without any uh, news on, on how this will behave. But the, the idea is that we, we use it as a, a scientific platform for, for the international community and build together with the other existing phases, phase systems, yes. Wonderful. I thought that would be an easy one to answer. We're just going to build on. So, well, well <laughs> just say that so Rob, Rob McKenzie uh, is the professor at the University of Birmingham who, who run the experiment in Staffordshire that we're visiting next week. So he's, he's been a, a key partner in this program as well. Wonderful. And we have questions in the room as well. If I could just ask, if you're asking a question, if you could just tell us who you are, where you're from, and if, you have, if your question is directed to anyone specifically, Nandi will bring you the microphone. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hello. Oh. Hi, uh, Charlotte Wheeler from the Centre for International Forestry Research. Um, I think this, it's really exciting that this experiment is going ahead, but I wonder, um, could you tell us when you expect the towers to be completed? And, and obviously it'll take a number of years before you're starting to get the data in and seeing the effect of this CO2 fertilisation on tree growth. I mean, how many years worth of data do you think you'll be needing to really understand how this elevated CO2 is, is going to be impacting the forest growth and you know all the mortality and recruitment dynamics happening within the Amazon forest. Yeah. Right. Um, so a bit of phasing of the project, isn't it? It was too short to, to talk about this. Um, in the first year, the idea is we will just build two pairs of rings uh, as some sort of proof of concept. Uh, that we can, in a tropical forest, uh, increase CO2 levels in, in the atmosphere. And the idea is, is in, in a second year, we would build, uh, would build the other, other six rings. In terms of um, results, some, some of the results we expect very early in the, in the experiment, like some of the process such as increasing photosynthesis or how respiration, uh, you know, leaf respiration or plant respiration uh, change with CO2, they, they can hap happen very fast uh, and can be monitored very fast. Other process like that will cascade uh, on the effects of uh, high CO2 will take longer. For instance, tree growth or forest dynamics, as you mentioned. And this will need that the, the experiment is maintained for a longer time. Um, our plan, our initial plan, is to have the experiment running for at least five years, uh, but ideally would be longer if, if funds are available, you know. Ideally, this should be a 10-year experiment at least, so we can look at these slower uh, changes in the forest. So. I hope I have answered. Would like to add anything? Thank you. Do you want to do one from this side of the room and then back over to Richard?
Thank you. I'm Gideon Henderson from DEFRA in the UK. Uh, as you've mentioned, there's a face experiment here in the UK, but there are not many globally. I wondered if you could just say a word about how many there are. And if you had more money for another one, where would you put it? What would be the next ecosystem that you would really want to understand through free air experiments like this? Thanks. Yeah, well, they, 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 some of them have, have kind of come and gone uh, over the years. So I think there's, would there be about five operational at the moment? Uh, I, I think. Uh, so there's, there's been some which have lasted just a, a, a small number of years. But uh, um, yes, there's not as many as we would like by any means. Yes, a, hand, a handful uh, are currently, currently working. Um, I think probably one in boreal ecosystems. Uh, again, this has been. Has, has there been one in, in, the, in the boreal regions before? No, no, no. no there's only one in temperate. That's one of the most North needed America. as well. Yeah. yeah, there's one in temperate forests in North America, isn't it, or more? But we've not got one in the boreal forest area, so I think there would be the next one. Hi, my name is Manuela Nunez. I'm 18 years old, and I'm from the foundation called Tremendas. And I have a question, especially because I do not understand uh, the impact of these uh, towers uh, on the Amazon. I mean, I believe it sounds a little bit aggressive, like the building and stuff. And so my question is, have you ever thought about the environmental impact of the buildings and the construction process? Because, I don't know, it sounds not that great, as, in my opinion. Hi, thanks for your question. Um, the idea is we, we want to understand an important scientific question to guide us through the future. And, and then this experiment, it has to be understand, understood as a laboratory. It's a small area of impact, which of course, to, to be able to reach the aims we have with experience, it has to be as natural, as pristine as possible. Of course, we have to put towers there, or we have to put a canopy crane, and there will be some impact. But it should not be taken as, uh, as really a protected forest. You know, it, it will be a small area, but it will be a laboratory. Okay, so there will be some impact because we are uh, hand, handmade constructing, you know, this. There, it's not something we do with machinery or something like that. It, it's, it's a very delicate uh, infrastructure building that we will have there. But there will be, of course, some impact. We are even throwing CO, more CO2 in the atmosphere. But that's for a good reason, you know. I think it's something that the scientific community wants for more than, for decades, for three, four decades. And it's really important information. And we will take all the care we can to have the forest in the best state as possible, because we need to, to have it to really be able to have good scientific results. And in terms of, for instance, emissions and um, our one year or of our plots working are equivalent uh, uh, a return long haul flight, you know. So it's not that aggressive, and we also will compensate all the emissions. We, we are environmental people; we are concerned about that as well. But I think it's it's a moment where actually the gains from uh, having the experiment are worth the damages that we may make, you know, because it's really, really, it's a small area, it's an experimental area, it's not a protected area or something like that. You can hardly see it from satellite, you can hardly see this from satellite or aerial photographs, this infrastructure, so it's not that aggressive. But it's also worth pointing out that you, you've, you've taken great care to minimise the impact, even in that small area, haven't, haven't you? We just, we've been discussing the design of the towers, the base. Uh, uh, is it going to involve uh, damaging roots? And you've made, been very careful to make sure it doesn't damage tree roots or, uh, and so on. So the design has been done very sensitively. So I think it will be as minimal impact as, as possible, won't it? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question as well. Richard, I believe you have a question for us as well. We probably have time for one or two more questions because we have a, a guest speaker on the line. So um, she's going to come uh, and close for us. Okay, thank you very much, Richard Jones, from Met Office Hatley Centre. So um, there was a point that Richard made, which was this is going to take a few years to generate results. But obviously, you know, we could really do with, 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 with tying down this uncertainty as soon as possible. You said that you've already been operating these, the, these towers for a while. Now, I'm just wondering, is, I, mean, I, I, I assume you probably are, but are you interacting with any of the Earth observation uh, um, activities in terms of measuring CO2 from space and also the very high res resolution land cover work that, that, that's, uh, that's going on and whether you can sort of link what you're doing here with those observations to, uh, to try and improve this, uh, this uncertainty estimate on the uptake of CO2? I think this, your question is a very important one, and it links to determining the overall carbon balance of the forest, right? And it's relatively well known how much you emit from deforestation, how much you absorb by forest regrowth. It's a relatively uncertain now at the moment how much you emit from forest degradation. This is much less known. But there is still another uh, uh, forest uh, important number there, which is how much the pristine forests absorb. And that's where we'll be touching. This. So this is the part we'll contribute to estimating the overall carbon balance of the Amazon. I hope I answered the question. So Maybe I can add to that as well. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Richard. So that's, this is where the, the, uh, the collaboration with the CSSP Brazil program will come in because we, we do some work in that area already so we're hoping that we can now do some of the work within the CSSP Brazil program to do this kind of thing to match what's happening in the, in the Amazon face work and join, join them together. Thank you we have time for one last question before we need to go to Thelma online. The microphone's yeah, already thank gone. you. Uh, my name is Karen Nascarinhas. I come from the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Innovation from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, my question would be, you mentioned something about the social aspect and studies in this part. I would like to know a little more about this, about the, uh, what kind of social aspects. Would it be involvement of the people from the area with the knowledge they have, the culture they have, you know, it, 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 the people that live close by or live in forests? Uh, that would be my question. Thank you. If I may. Uh we are not talking about here solely on the role that the forest may play in helping us uh, halt climate change, but we are talking about the whole existence of the forest as, it, as it's also uh, subject to climate change, to the effects of climate change. And as such, it wants, if we, if we had something like that scenario that we lose a lot of the forest to climate change, uh, it's not only about uh, the effects on indigenous people, on traditional communities, but also on the people living in cities. I mean, at least 60% of the people in the Amazon live in cities. And it might be hard for us to think, but they do depend on the forest as well. For example, for, for water provision. Uh, so for us, in terms of the, 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 the workflow, in this uh, component of the project, the key word for us, or the key term, is ecosystem services. So that's how we will approach this uh, social economic uh, domain. I mean, how, wh what ecosystem services the forest provide, and what, which of these will be affected by the elevated CO2 and climate change in general, and how this reflects in society in general, including indigenous people, traditional communities, but also importantly, urban populations as well in, in the Amazon. Thank you. We had about another 10 questions online, and I know there are more questions in the room, but there is another event after us, so I'm afraid we're going to have to, to draw the Q&A to a close just there. But I know our researchers are around for a few more days yet, so I'm sure they would take the opportunity to talk to you about the project in a bit more detail. Um, I'd now like to welcome, hopefully she's still on the line, um, Thelma Krug, um, who's vice chair of the IPCC and is a retired researcher from um, the uh, Brazilian National, I can't even say it now, National Institute for Space Research, MP, um, who'd like to say a few closing remarks. Um, Thelma, over to you. 
Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really delighted and it was extraordinary to, to hear both sides of the presentation of, uh, of the project. Well, uh, possibly I'll be changing my head as a, as, as a uh, retired researcher from INPE, who is, uh, which is one of the partners of this phase project, and, uh, and IPCC, possibly more like uh, a previous researcher for 37 years. Uh, in, at EMP. So, but there are two things from this uh, phase project that really comes very close to my heart. One is obviously Amazonia. And Amazonia being the largest rainforest in the world, having the biodiversity, incredible biodiversity, a huge carbon stock. And it's not come close to my heart, but I think it comes closer to the hearts of everyone. So despite the fact that Brazil does share uh, the Amazonian basin with seven other countries, uh, Brazil has the large, largest share. And Amazonia covers basically 50% of the Brazilian territory. So it's really huge. So when, when there was that question that I'm going to address very quickly on the towers, when you have a chance to go over one of those towers, because we have some towers already uh, in Amazonia, it's incredible. You see just you know, a sea of green big, huge forest. It's just a, an experience that can never be forgotten. But anyway, so Amazonia, it's needless to say the importance. But anyway, despite the fact that the, biome, the Amazonian biome is potentially one of the most studied biomes in Brazil, with a huge uh, scientific production available, but nonetheless, uh, there is still uh, important gaps in knowledge. And I think that face is gonna reduce that gap. And from the presentations that have been done, I'm absolutely sure that, that that's gonna be a very, very helpful um, uh, project. But anyway, from the second point that I said, two issues are close to my heart. One is Amazonia and the next one is uh, partnerships. And why do I say that? Because I've, I was very fortunate that during my, uh, my research at INPE, I was able to participate in a large scale biosphere atmosphere experiment in Amazonia, the so-called LBA, that had that engaged uh, scientists from uh, a diverse number of institutions from the USA and also from Europe. And that was back in the 90s. And it's still INPA. Uh, holds the coordination of, of that product. So it's still bringing in a scientific result. So it's just absolutely incredible. So this partnership uh, through the LBA uh, experiment um, left behind not only research findings, it, le it left behind new skills, new friends, stimulating discussions, and more important, the recognition that even in very far parts of the world, one could find exceptional and committed researchers, several of whom are now leading the FACE experiment. So I'm so pleased to, to see that and see the leadership of INPA, because you know institutions that are far, far away from the center of uh, research is now taking the lead. And I think LBA left a little bit of this history, but now we see this very strong, very credible institution, not only in Amazonia, but in Brazil, taking the lead. So this partnership, UK-Brazil, and in particular between, uh, between UK scientists and uh, Amazonian researchers, uh, through this partnership, it, it comes at a very special moment uh, because uh, it, it, it is a fact that we, we should be in times where you would have more investments for science. But unfortunately, instead of being escalating in some parts, uh, in many parts or some parts, uh, this is not happening. And it's really a, a, a something that brings us, us back. Without science, it is not possible for us to understand. And without science in Amazonia, it's impossible for us to understand what are going to be the impacts of climate change for good and for bad. So I'm absolutely convinced that phase through this UK-Brazil climate science partnership that engages very recognized institutions from the UK and from Brazil 
will be very valuable to help improve the understanding of the effect of rising CO2 emissions to the forest uh, primary productivity through photosynthesis, as has already been said, the CO2 fertilization effect. And if this effect may be sufficient to maintain the stability of the vegetation cover in the, in the atmosphere, considerably, in an atmosphere that is considerably warmer and subject to, the same, uh, to, to, to several uh, climatic, uh, se uh, extreme climatic events. So I also, from the LBA, will, I'm just coming to, to an end on this, but I would like to highlight one element that I find extremely important. It is an opportunity of other, uh, also offered to master and doctorate students at IMPA, at IMPA, IMPE, and other institutions to engage with such a diverse number of uh, researchers in Brazil and the UK. And this will surely motivate them to create roots, scientific roots in Amazonia. So it's an opportunity to see, or that I see, for the future academic and research communities, learning with the more experienced professionals and in finding already opportunities to enlarge their knowledge. So I, I do think that LBA left behind a lot of this opportunity for the students that created these roots. And I'm sure FACE will do the same. So finally, needless to say, uh, you must know that IPCC doesn't do its own research, so it has to rely on scientific publications all over the world. So evidence-based science is the engine of the IPCC. So I am absolutely sure that possibly already in the next uh, assessment cycle of the IPCC, results from Amazon phase will be included, shedding more light into the response of the Amazon biome to climate change. So with this, I would like to thank all the presentations. I would like to thank this UK partnership with Brazil. I myself have been engaged in discussions uh, before when I was in Brasilia myself. And I am really thrilled uh, that this cooperation is gonna be extraordinary results for the knowledge of Amazonia. Thank you so much. Thank you to Thelma, but also to all of our speakers this evening. I think we've learned a lot about the Amazon face experiment and the partnership between Brazil and UK, particularly in terms of the science. Um, I'm afraid it's time for the event to draw to a close, but I'd like you to give a final round of applause, please, to everyone that was involved in the event. Thank you.